All right, it is March 19th. This is part 10 of our Creation to Christ, Looking for Christ in the Old Testament series. Do that because I have also spent many hours trying to figure out which week the videos I uploaded were. All right. I spent a little bit of time recapping what we've been looking at. Don't worry, it should, should hopefully make sense. First set of verses here are references for what we've learned so far. So before we get started, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to learn more about your word. I pray that you'll help me preach what you want me to preach. Help me get out of your way. For people to see you and not me. Speak through me, help them see you, and help me to say what you want me to say, and not say what you don't want me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so, week one, we looked at God creates the world. Why? It's a place for mankind. <coughs> what were you going to say, brother? I thought you were saying, why did we look at it, or why did he create it? No, well, either way, I'll take, I'll take either answer. Right. God creates man, puts Adam in it. What does Adam do immediately? Sins. Does God destroy Adam completely immediately? No. No. It's almost as if God planned for that. He did. All right. So Adam continues to live, has children. Do they do everything perfectly? No. No, they mess up too. Ten generations later, we meet a man called Noah. God told Noah to build an ark. What does he do? He builds an ark. Saves right. his house. If you look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 14, I'll give you just a second to turn some of these. These are just references um, to what we've covered before. Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Okay, Hebrews 11, or Hebrews 11, verse 7. This is just a quick recap of the first 10 weeks. So we know where we're at. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So, even though they, and even though they messed up, Adam and Noah believed God. <coughs> Ten generations later, we meet a man called Abraham. Turn to Romans 4. Romans 4, verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay? So 20 generations in, we have the beginning of mankind at Adam. We have 10 generations later, we have Noah. 10 generations later, we have Abraham. Well, what, what's special about Abraham? What, what does Abraham get that the previous generations don't get? The promise. He gets a promise, Brother Mark puts it. What was he promised, Brother Mark? He was promised that his, his uh, heirs would be as, uh, as, multiple, as multiplied as the stars of heaven, the sands of the sea. He was promised lots of descendants. Now you may think, well, that's, that's simple. All you got to do is have lots of kids, and they'll have lots of kids. You'll have lots of descendants, right? No, not necessarily back in those days. You could have a family. You can have lots of kids and grandkids in your house, and some neighboring neighboring tribe can wipe you out completely. You'd be no more. So if God promises you're going to have lots of descendants, he's promising you're going to survive and endure and be protected. Okay. And because Abraham is going to be protected, and he's going to have lots of kids, 
you're going to teach your kids what I'm about to tell you. Okay, so he's teach Abraham something. So Abraham has Isaac, and Isaac has Jacob. Now, what was special about Jacob? Wasn't he? It's a good question. He valued his birthright and the blessing. Was the birthright and the blessing his to have? No, he fought for both. He, he connived, he manipulated, he fought, he bartered, he got both, neither one were his. Why? Because he valued and found them important. He wanted to be the one, because he knew Esau wasn't going to do it. Okay? So Jacob takes to heart this, let's be a great nation, and has 12 sons. It's a good start. Well, Jacob's sons were all just Pinnacles of righteousness. Great men and leaders, right? Scallywags. No, they were rogues. Scallywags. They were they were visiting prostitutes in the gates and killing their little brother and all these other things that aren't exactly what you're looking for in priests of family. Okay, but there's Joseph. Now, there was something special about Joseph. What was special about Joseph? It's, we went over this four weeks ago. And the one deciding factor the Bible says about Joseph. Blank face. And the Lord was with Joseph. See, the Lord was with Joseph. Joseph did a lot of things right, but... It wasn't because Joseph was so special. It's because the Lord was with Joseph to preserve his house, right? What does he tell his brothers? Here's the answer to the question. The Lord, you meant it for evil, but the Lord meant it for good, okay? So the Lord used Joseph to preserve his family, okay? 430 years after Joseph, where are the children of Israel? Now, there's not a few of them, though. The Bible says there's 600,000 men went out. So, at this point, Jacob, Abraham, Israel, they're a great nation. Right? Okay. So, we're going to wrap our, our, uh, our recap here. So, we looked last week. He gave Moses the law, and they established the tabernacle, and God was with the children of Israel, gave them manna from heaven, protect, got them across the Red Sea, protected them in the wilderness, fed them, watered them, no small feat. If you ever try to feed a big group of people, almost the biggest group of people you've ever tried to feed, even with help. 100 people, 200 people, okay? If you ever have a wedding, you're trying to cater a wedding, trying to feed 100, 200 people, it's chore. Food's gotta be carted in, Place for them to sit. You gotta have people to cook it. You gotta have people to serve it. You gotta have people clean up. Food, feeding a hundred people is no small chore. The children of Israel numbered in the millions. And where were they traveling? Were they traveling through lush green rainforests of fruit? Barren desert. Barren desert. There's no food or water anywhere. God preserves them like little children all the way through it. Okay? So this is happily ever after, right? They make it to the promised land. Numbers chapter 13. Is that what happens? If y'all read the Bible, y'all know it's not. Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. I'm looking. This is this is the logical progression here. We've skipped a lot of a fill-in. There's a lot of information here. And I'd encourage you to read the, the Bible cover to cover, but we're going to go through and hit the highlights here. Because we, we're only here 30 minutes a week instead of 40 hours a week. We can only get the highlights. All right? So Numbers chapter 13, they've made it to Kadesh Barnea. They're, they are on the border of the land that God promised them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give. I want you to underline that or think about that for a second. Which I give. 
It was not that you have earned. It was not that I will give. It is not that you can take. It says, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their father shall you send a man, everyone a ruler among them. Okay? It says, I'm here. You're here. I'm going to give it to you. And Moses, by the command of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And they go down and it lists them all here. And they go down and they spend 40 days spying, scoping it out. What do they call it in the Marines? Recon. Recon. It was a recon mission, a 40 day recon mission. I'm going to tell you that, that force recon is not in the Bible. Here it is. So they go and go down to uh, look at verse 23. This is important. What do they bring back with them? They, they've been in a desert, folks, where there's no food or water. And they come back out of this and they come, verse 23, they come under the brook of Eskel and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff. That's a big cluster of grapes. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. And the place was called the brook Eskel because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. There's so much fruit that it's just out there to get. They, it doesn't say they, they fought off of a vineyard. It that they gathered and took back. Proof that there was that there was yeah there was fruit and loot <laughs> verse twenty six and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land and they told him and said we came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it nevertheless the people there be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great moreover we saw the children of Anak there and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it but the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land of which we had gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in there are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Oh, it's too hard. We can't do it. We can't go into the promised land. It's too hard to do. Yeah, that's the point. Haven't you been listening? That's the point. Of course it's too hard and you can't do it. God didn't ask you to do it. He asked you to trust him that he was going to do it. Does that make, does that sound familiar? Does that sound like something else God says he's going to do or has done? See, all through here, God is teaching. And the children of Israel, they just looked at the, the problem and said, oh, there's no way we can do that. We'll never get it. God says, it wasn't about you. I promised it. Folks, this is just how God gives us salvation. He says, you got to keep the law. Oh, that's too hard. I will never be able to keep the law. Exactly. That's why Christ did it for you and offers it to you freely. All you've got to do is trust him. What does Caleb say? Caleb saw the same thing everybody else said. He goes, let's go now. Why? Caleb knew who was fighting. Caleb knew it wasn't him. All right. So if you look in Chapter 14, I won't read the whole chapter here, but what do they do? They, do they go, oh, let's let's go up and, and, and try? 
No, they say, oh, let's let's go back to Egypt. In verse 4, it says, let us make a captain. By the way, Moses has been the voice of God and has led them through all of this. And they said, let's get rid of Moses. Let's make a captain. And let's go back to bondage. Are you in? We, we, we want to, like, reach through the pages of history, grab them by the scruff of the neck. Go, are you insane? Let's go back to Egypt where they are trying to kill us because it's too hard here. Yes, you. It's much easier if we just go die at the hands of the Egyptians and have them fight these people and die in there to get their years of money. <laughs> I don't think they were thinking. They're very, uh, very emotional people. All right. Yes. So what is it? So what does God say to Moses? How long will these people provoke me? And how long, this is verse 11 I'm reading, and how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? You know, people say, well, I don't believe in God because I don't see any signs of it. If God spoke to me out of heaven or if God showed me a miracle, I'd believe. No, you won't. Here's millions of people that saw miracles on the daily that said, you know what, God doesn't exist, let's go back to Egypt. Just, ah, what's wrong with you? In verse 12, and I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. God says, I don't need them. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm done with them. You know, this, is, this is one of the most fed up times in the Bible you ever see God. God's like, you know what? I'll wipe them out. Moses, buddy, how do you feel about getting some more wives? <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about having some more kids? And Moses basically says, verse 15, Moses says to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear it. In other words, people will say you couldn't deliver these people. In other words, people will blame you. People will say that this is what was going to happen all along. And there it goes, okay. In verse 20, it says, uh, the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Whew! Wow, I have pardoned according to thy word. They don't know how close they came. They don't know how close they came. And the Lord said, I, I pardon according to the word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because of all those men which have seen my glory, my miracles, which I did in Egypt in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Tomorrow, it says, and now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. So what happens when you reject the promise of God? Mm -hmm. Wandering. What happened? In, sorry, what was that? Wandering. What happened in the wilderness? They live a long, happy life in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. They find them another home. Sure. Verse twenty-nine tells us what happens. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Whoops. Go die in the wilderness. Okay. You want to reject me? Go, go, go off and die. Wow. Where does that sound familiar? We are promised a promised land. But if we reject God, if we don't believe him, what's our alternative? Hell. All right, go die. There's your option. Now things go from bad to worse for the Israelites. Wasn't a happy fun time in the wilderness. Wasn't a wasn't summer camp. They started dying quickly. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 16. <clears throat> Children of Israel chose to do what most people choose to do. They rejected the promise and the word of the Lord and said that if we can't do it, it's not possible and we want something else. God says there's only one other option. Go die. Verse 16, Hebrews 3. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. 
But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, this is Hebrews 4, verse 1, lest the promise being left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Things went from bad to worse for the Israelites once they rejected God's rest. Did they stop and think and go, okay, now we'll listen to God, even though we're stuck in the wilderness? Nah. What happens first? Well, they run out of water. No biggie. This has happened before. Seriously, this has happened before. They run out of water and they go to Moses. Turn back to Numbers. Turn back to Numbers, verse 20. Chapter, uh, numbers chapter 20. Thank you. I said verse 20. Chapter 20, verse 8. Looking for Numbers chapter 20. Once you decide not to listen to God, things do not get better. Things get progressively worse. Things that made sense before don't make sense anymore. Things that worked before don't work anymore. Verse 8, take the rod. If Israelites run out of water, this happened before, no big deal. Take the rod, gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and the beast strength. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and the beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Wait, what? What happened? Why? Um, two things. Two things? What happened? He smote the rock. He didn't he speak to the rock. He didn't believe God. He didn't believe God. His instructions were to what? Speak. Speak. Verse 8 says, Speak ye to the rock. Why did he hit it? Frustrated. And, uh, I mean, I understand that. I really sympathize with that guy. I mean, it's like, you ever been middle management? I'm, as in the military, I'm sure you you get an order from on high, you take the people below you, and it's not the guy that gave the order that gets chewed out, that gets complained to. It's it's the guy in the middle. So Moses here has, has got the middle management job of explaining, and they're they're blaming Moses. But it was important that he speak to the rock. Why? Does it symbolize Christ? Symbolized Christ because Moses was punished severely for this. Severely for this. Because the whole history of the nation of Israel has been about what? Faith, trust. It's been about teaching them about Jesus. The whole history of the nation of Israel from, from the beginning of time has been about the Savior that's coming. Adam, his sin was put aside. The Savior's coming. Noah believed and his family went into the ark, the picture being in Jesus. The Savior is coming. Abraham was told, I will make of thee a great nation, and in all and in thee all nations of the world be blessed. What's he saying? From your line, from your family, from your peoples, I will send a Savior. Isaac and Jacob. Believe that and taught their children. Now they are a great nation. They're supposed to be 
trusting the Lord. Was there, was there evidence for them to trust the Lord? Tons. Mountains of it. Oceans of it. Literally. <laughs> Literally oceans of it. Where God had, had moved oceans and mountains and everything and, and wiped out armies in the way for them to believe that he was God. And yet, yet here they're like, no, nah, place too difficult. We can't believe God. And now they've rejected God. And God's still teaching. He tells Moses, Let's go perform a picture. And Moses messes up the picture. Because Jesus only died once for sin. And Moses struck the rock twice. So he mars the picture of Christ. So Moses' punishment is he doesn't get to go into the land of Egypt or land of Canaan. Well, does it get better there? Do things improve? Now turn turn to Romans, uh, sorry, not Romans, Numbers 21. Let's keep looking. Numbers 21. Oh, and in this time, next Aaron dies. And his son uh, Eleazar is made a priest. In verse 21, and in ver or chapter 21 and verse 5, the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul lo loathes this, this, light, this light bread. Wait, 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 wait. She's telling me God's still raining manna from heaven every morning? And so there's not any water. Okay, let me ask you. How many days can a human go without water before they stop complaining about water? Two or three. Depend, uh, in the desert, it's not a long time. So if you're complaining about there being no water, have you yet died of no water? Mm -hmm. So there has got to be some water. Maybe maybe you run out of water. Now, I've, I've been hiking, and I've run out of water, and it makes me cranky. Um, I was on the Appalachian Trail, and my, and my canteen fell over. I propped it up on something open. It fell over. It spilled all my water out. And my camelback was already empty, and I'd lost my water bottle over the day. So I literally had no water. One of my companions <coughs> gave me a little bit of their water. I had to ration that out so I got connected. Well, I didn't have more water, but I wasn't about to die of dehydration. I was cranky about it, but I still have water. They said, there's no water. I wasn't going to die because I knew that there was going to be another spring in a few miles. They didn't trust there being more water. But God's still raining manna from heaven every morning. They're going to complain about it. Well, the Lord has apparently just had it at this point with these Israelites. And what happens next? Look at verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. That seems kind of abrupt. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Why? That seems kind of harsh. God's trying to teach them something. Now, let's imagine ourselves in this camp in the desert. And you get bit by a snake. What part of that kills you? Snakes have little teeth. You don't die of the bleeding. It's poison. <clears throat> ah, you're close. It's not poison in a poison in a snake's fangs. What is it? It's venom. Okay. There's a difference. Venom's important. What does venom do? Venom attacks the blood. Mm -hmm. Venom destroys the outer membrane of capillary vessels, causing internal bleeding, and in other cases, causes active blood clotting and clots around the circulatory system. Venom destroys the blood, which is the life. That's why you die from snake bite, a venomous snake bite. If you eat it and you die, it poisons it, bites you and you die of venom, basically. So, God says, okay, you don't value the truth. You don't value my provision. There's, there's bad attitude here. The blood of Christ is of none effect to you. Okay, die. Verse 7, 
Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Oh, now we're starting to understand. This right here, this sentence right here is why. All this. The thinking had to change. We have sinned. You think? You think that maybe this has been going, coming a long, long time coming? For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Now that's some long suffering. Moses is still praying for the people. He's lost his reward. These people have just run him ragged for the last years and years. And now he's going to die in the wilderness. His brother just died. And they say, pray for us. Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Okay. That's interesting. The serpent of brass, the serpents represent judgment. But judgment lifted up Cause them to live. Turn to John chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 3. We're getting close to the end here. See, first, God showed them the blessing. That here, here's all the goodness. Here's the promised land. No, okay, don't believe that. All right, I'll show you what happens instead. If you're not going to listen to the goodness, understand understand the alternative. But even in their judgment, even in the alternative, John chapter 3, verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So even here, in the middle of the desert, the middle of the judgment, the middle of the Old Testament, we see an example of Christ. We see that lifting up Christ and believing on him is how we escape judgment. The Israelites chose not to believe God, and they didn't go into the promised land. Folks, if you don't believe God, there's no other way to heaven. John 14, 6 says, what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, we, we tend to stand here and kind of laugh almost at the stubbornness of the children of Israel, at their short-sightedness, at their lack of belief. But folks, we're just like that. We still do that. Mankind still goes, nah, I refuse to see the miracles. I refuse to believe God. I refuse. I refuse. That can't be. That is not. That's not what I want. You know what? I don't even know if God is real. Let's go back to Egypt. What did Egypt represent, Mom? Spiritually speaking. Bondage, the law. Okay. Let's go, let's go back to slavery. We are no longer under the law. Why? Weren't they during the Egypt of their history they did that too? <sighs> okay, so I believe you can make the journey on foot in about four months. Slowly moving. If you are on horseback or camel, or if it's just adults, I believe it can be made in like two months. Uh don't quote me on that. I've done the research at some point. It's not close. Sinai Peninsula is, does not take you 40 years to cross. Because I always thought, it's like, oh, wow, they just they got lost and they, you know, they wandered back and forth here for a little bit because they couldn't figure out where to go. No, they, they literally did this. 
Yeah. They just they just wandered. Because he got tired. Yes. Um, but God still provided manna. God still provided food. We know that because there's no other source of food for them to have lived on out there in the Sinai Peninsula. And it says here, we, we're tired of light bread. We've been eating it for a couple of years. I don't know how long it took them to get from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea there, but um, they certainly thought that they knew where they were and they could go back. It certainly wouldn't have taken them 40 years to go back to Egypt. God says, there's no going back. There's no going back. What actually did they want? Yeah. So, today's lesson is projection of God <coughs> results in punishment, results in wilderness. But Christ, just like the serpent, you have to turn your attention to Christ for salvation. Christ has to get the credit. Like the, the Israelites weren't going to win the battle to go into the promised land. They tried and they failed. Why? Because God says, you, you didn't believe me. Folks, Christ has to get the credit for salvation. It's the only way it works. If you want credit for salvation, God says, I'll share none of it. My son didn't die on the cross for your sins for you to get some of the credit. I didn't pay for your salvation for you to say, oh, I paid for some of it. No. Either all Christ or death. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the church, our people here, Lord. We ask you to give us a good week. Bless us and bring us back next week. In Jesus' name, amen.